Dear friends, allow up high again and welcome everybody uh, to this session. Really, it's a continuation of Ken's talk uh, this morning, uh, where he shared information about the February 25th letter and how that was written and its relationship to race and the whole issue of the NSA members and the counselors meeting with the uh, the, Internet, the House of Justice and the International Teaching Center members. And so really, we want to continue this discussion, not just about race in general, but as much as we can within the framework for action, you know, so we can understand, so we as together can learn what is it the House of Justice is asking us to do when it comes to addressing race? How are they asking us to engage with the elimination of racial prejudice? What guidance are they giving us in that regard? And I think this guidance has been coming to us for quite some time, but for some reason it seems like in many cases when I'm at conferences or I'm in different places, I'm not hearing people to re refer to addressing race within the framework for action. And that's not a criticism. It's more of an observation and to say, and maybe it's out there and maybe people are doing it and they're just not uh, uh, addressing it. But maybe in this session and the session tomorrow, we can learn together more about how to do this. And I think that's really the purpose of, of why we're here. And I hope we all can come with a certain posture of humility because I don't believe any of us knows the answers to this. You think that's right? Does anybody know the answers to this? No, I'm, I'm really serious because we have to somehow, at this particular time in history, come to grips with it and come to grips with this and, and really start to humbly figure it out. I want to thank Ken for the opportunity to do this, my white southern brother. <laughs> Let's clap for Ken. We joked that he's a white southerner from, from Georgia and I'm the black midwesterner from Minnesota. <laughs> if you were just to ask us, you'd think, well, you know, I'm probably from the south and he's probably from Minnesota. <laughs> just the opposite. Friends, you know, one of the things I just want to be as transparent as I can because I think we're all learning. You know this conference, I've heard about this conference, I've only been here once. Uh, probably 25 years ago I presented maybe to youth, I don't even remember, 25 years ago. And all around the country, you know, this conference is known not as a Grand Canyon conference, but the Persian conference. Is that right? Okay, this is a Persian conference where all the Persians come together, right? And, and you think, oh, you know, gosh, do I want to go to that? You know, am I going to be welcome here? You know, do I belong here in the, quote, Persian conference? And then when you stop and reflect on that sort of thing, you say, what's going on with that? You know, what, what have I been hearing over the years about the Persian conference? And what kind of stereotypes am I carrying and what kind of attitudes am I carrying about this? You know, I even, I even when I knew I was coming, I kind of had a little bit of hesitation. I thought, well, where'd that come from? Why do I have any hesitation about going with my brothers and sisters, my Baha'i brothers and sisters? But you get stuff in your head that you don't even know is there. And over time, some of these things become normalized and you don't even think about it until what? You get in the situation. This is part of what the House of Justice is asking us to do, is to get in situation. So my little situation was coming here. Praise God. And I'm here with my brothers and sisters, but I really honestly had to reflect on my biases and my prejudices, what I was expecting, what I wasn't expecting. I mean, I've had an amazing time, utterly amazing time. I felt most welcome. You know, the stereotypes start to disappear as you what? As you interact, as you engage with each other as you have conversation, as you talk about service, as you call in the creative word, et cetera, et cetera, all these things start to break down the stereotypes. So to my Persian brothers and sisters, thank you for welcoming me to the Grand Canyon Conference. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> you know, and I say that with all my heart because I think these things are real. The other thing I wanted to say about calling on the ancestors, I mean, I thought about this. I saw somebody in the hall who was from Mission, uh, South Dakota, one of the reservations up there, and uh, my mother-in-law pioneered there for 20 years uh, by herself. I think she went in her uh, either late 70s or 80s. And, you know, I was thinking of her spirit, and I thought her spirit conveyed so much of what it is that we need to be about when it comes to addressing race, her earnestness and her purity of motive. First of all, she goes to, to, to Mission South Dakota by herself and doesn't really know anybody, gets in the car. They, she had a marriage, they got divorced after 40 years. After the divorce, boom, gets in the car, goes to Mission South Carolina, where she knows nobody and is not familiar with the culture, really, uh, to any degree. But this woman uh, was spent some time near the end of her life really just confined to bed. 
she couldn't get out of bed. Um, but she uh, got a hold of my book, which is called Seeing Heaven in the Face of Black Men. Now, that's not a commercial, even though it is in the bookstore. Um, <laughs> as is Ken's book. <laughs> Anyway, she, she, she got a hold of this book, and she couldn't read at that point in her life. And she asked her son to read this book to her. And, you know, again, she couldn't get out of bed, and I was in awe that she wanted to read this book, which is about race, which is about addressing race from a spiritual context, which is about an African-American kind of perspective on dealing with race and trying to come to grips with it from a spiritual perspective. And she said she wanted to know about that book, and, you know, when I found out about that, and I know she's, I mean, she's barely alive. I'm not exaggerating. She can't get out of bed. And so we asked her why she wanted her son to read her that book. And she said, well, I just want to make sure I don't do anything to offend anybody black. And this is somebody who's confined to her bed, who's thinking about, even in that state of mind, her mindset about interacting with black people. I think that's the spirit that we have to engage as we, as we move forward. Second thing I wanted to say is when Ken told this story this morning about Paducah, Kentucky, which I had no idea he was going to tell that story uh, at all, I have a particular relationship with Paducah, which I never told you about either, because I didn't know you were going to tell that story. But it's a beautiful story, but there, and there's a backstory to that. And the backstory is just as beautiful. And the reason I'm sharing this story is to look at the ways that we can address issues of race within the community building activities, within what the House of Justice says are three areas within expansion and consolidation, public discourse, and social action. And that we need to be thinking creatively about how to do that. We need to think outside the box about how to do that and not just come at it from one particular way, which is the National Spiritual Assembly's recent letter really addressed that. They kept telling us, how are the different ways that we can begin to address teaching and the community building activities? They said some may do it this way and some may do it that way. And they were creating this open door for us to do it in different ways. Well, Paducah, Kentucky, Kentucky several years ago, uh, and this is a, a beautiful story, woman, and I'm going to butcher the story, but I want you to get the point. If anybody's here from Paducah, you can correct me later. But here's the gist of it. A woman, uh, a white uh, woman named Connie Donnelly. Uh, who was very much engaged with the NAACP and race activities in that particular community, uh, passed away. And when she passed away, you know, she had been, as I said, involved with the NAACP chapter. When she passed away, uh, they looked for a place to hold the funeral. And they went to a black funeral home. And of course, Connie was white, Connie was white, and they went to a black funeral home, and the black funeral home accepted to do this funeral. They had never, never done a white, fun uh, a white funeral, a funeral for a white person ever before Connie Donnelly. And so they did this funeral and there was a pastor involved and I'm no doubt one of the pastors who was involved in this many years ago. They did this, well, several years ago, uh, they conducted this funeral. And from that particular experience, which brought black and white together in ways that they hadn't seen, coming to this funeral for Connie Donnelly because people of both races, black and white in this case, had so much love for her, and out of that, they decided that they really needed to do something to address race in Paducah, Kentucky, of all places, right? And so they came together with several people and they had conversation. And they went online and, you know, good fortune, every, time, every now and then you do something that God just blesses and you have nothing to do with it. They found a, a movie, that I, a documentary film that I was in. And the guy, uh, Floyd, recognized me, and so he called, and they started talking about this film and bringing this film to Paducah, Kentucky. They brought the film. They had probably over time maybe 500 or 600 people that came together to see this film. From this film, they started having race dialogues. For over a year, they had race dialogues, bringing everybody from the sheriff together to the pastors together to so many leaders in the entire community for over a year and a half, they had these dialogues, and this spread to other communities, Baha'i communities throughout uh, the Midwest, uh, Springfield, Illinois, some other places, I think. So all of this is taking place in the background before this ever happened, and they're having, building all of these relationships with all of these people. But the point of it is, their motives in doing this initially were not to teach the faith. They were, their motives were to promote discourse and social action. We need to do something. But out of that, out of those pure motives, out of starting in one sense with discourse 
not really expansion and consolidation, but really with just discourse and social action, because their motives were pure and ultimately they wanted to engage the entire uh, community, set of community building activities. And when I heard Ken say what had happened since, now that's what happened since because of what they did way back then in building those relationships over a period of time with their purity of motive. You know, social action is de not designed to produce enrollments. Social action is designed to just do that, to just serve the community. Public discourse is not necessarily designed to promote directly the Baha'i faith or get enrollments. It's about serving the community, and it may lead to that, but the motives are so pure, the motives have to be pure. And so I think the point of it was that I was trying to make is let's open the box wide to how we think about engaging race, how we think about addressing this, uh, the uh, expansion and consolidation activities, social discourse, excuse me, social discourse and um, social action and, and um, public discourse. Question? Oh, God, help me. Ken, you got to do it real, can you do it real quick? Just, just real quick. All right. All right. Okay. First, sorry you weren't there, Steve. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, your wife. I know you're blaming it on her. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was it was a remarkable story. But what I was doing was sort of um, being effusive about the stories that we were receiving at the National Center from friends who were writing their experiences about the bicentenaries. And the one that I chose actually to share as a narrative that was sent to us was from Paducah. And it had to do, as Todd was saying, with a, a small group of Baha'is, they don't even have an assembly there, who had for some time been working with other local pastors on the issue of race unity. So that part you, you gathered from what Todd said. And then, of course, they invited these same pastors to the bicentenary events. And then right after that, they invited them to attend a meeting on the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program. And the... Pastors apparently were extremely impressed by the film, Light to the World, that was shown at the Bicentenary, and it really infused the discussion of the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program with a completely new meaning, because they could see uh, the impact of the teachings of Baha'u'llah around the world. And so they were so impressed with it that it came to the point, well, let's find ways to share with the youth and junior youth in all of our congregations. One of the pastors then expressed the concern, well, what if some of our congregants object to this? And I think presumably because it comes from a Baha'i source, to which another pastor responded, well, let them see the film, Light to the World, and then they'll understand why we're doing this. So it was really a remarkable confirmation of all of this activity that had taken place in that area, and the receptivity to the message that seems to be now emerging in our country. Mm -hmm. So friends, as we go into this, I, I put this quote up here that Ken talked about this morning too, and I'm not going to read that whole quote, but you can see it. You know, one of the things that, uh, Dorothy Baker said, and you know, she's a hand of the cause, and she, so she could say this, but uh, she said that Sh Shoghi Effendi was fanatical. Now what would, he, what would she say that about? He was fanatical about what? What do you think? He was fanatical about race. That's part of what, he, what she said at that conference. She, he was fanatical. Now, I wouldn't say that myself. I'm almost scared to even repeat it. But Dorothy Baker said that. So that's, that's what she felt about this. That's what he felt about this. That's the sense that, that she got when she was with him and when she came to that convention. And so as we start to think about this, I hope we can assume a little fanaticism in terms of how we think about moving forward with this. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, but I need that, mean that in a passionate sense. Because it's complex to address race. We have to address race in and out of the Baha'i community. We have to address race within ourselves. We have to address race within the broader community. We have to address the outcome and the consequences of racism. And what I mean by that, the outcome and consequences of racism, we have to address things like poverty, we have to address things like lack of education and violence. And so all of those things uh, constitute addressing the elimination of racial prejudice. It's not just looking, again, at people like in the KKK and doing these things. It's not just looking on the outside of the community and trying to address race from the outside. But it's addressing it from inside ourselves, inside our Baha'i communities, outside our Baha'i communities, 
and also the consequences of racism. So this is, uh, in my view, a, very, a fairly complex uh, topic. And I think one of the things that struck me as I was preparing for this is the connection of what the House of Justice gave us to the bicentenary and Baha'u'llah. You know, this is a passage that so many of us have, have read so many times, that the ancient beauty has consented to be bound with chains that mankind may be released from its bondage and have accepted to be made a prisoner within this most mighty stronghold that the whole world may attain under true liberty. Now, we read that, and it's so touching, and it's so moving. You can't not be moved in one sense by this quote. But then the House of Justice gives us a way to deal with why Baha'u'llah suffered and how he suffered. They give us a way to deal with humanity's oppression, humanity's bondage, humanity's lack of liberty. And so this, this is a passage many of you may be familiar with, but I wasn't familiar with it before a couple of years ago. House of Justice says the process set in motion by the current series of global plans seeks in its approaches, it takes, and the methods it employs to build capacity in every human group, to arise and contribute to the advancement of civilization. We pray that as it steadily unfolds its potential to disable every instrument devised by humanity over the long period of its childhood for one group to oppress another, may be realized. Is that profound or what? Truly. So we have this instrument, we have this tool, we have this community building process that the House of Justice is praying will disable every single instrument devised by humanity for one group to oppress another. Is that how we viewed this? Is this how we've seen the community building activities when we're out there doing children's classes? That This is a tool. These are the things that are going to allow us to move forward and eliminate really from the face of the earth, racial prejudice. I think this is profound, and I just wanted us to pause on that really just for a minute to think about that, because what we have in these community building activities, and one of the things that I've tried to do in myself is to figure out, to think through, you know, what, what does it mean, how do these community building activities remove oppression? What is it about these community building activities? And these, these are reflective thoughts for now. What is it about these community building activities that can remove these instruments that humanity has created to, for one group to oppress another? What is it about the study circle that does that? What is it about the, the children's classes and the junior youth groups that do that? What is it about devotional gatherings and home visits? What is it about those that actually combine? It says the methods and the approaches. So if we stop to think, and these are rhetorical questions in one sense, as we're in our communities and thinking about how to address race, have we stopped to really analyze what are the methods and approaches the House of Justice is talking about in what we are probably already doing so we can be a bit maybe more intentional about that. So part of what we'll talk about the next few days and partly today and partly tomorrow are some practical applications and practical understanding of what a few of these methods and approaches are. This will be a beginning process. There's more, it will take more time, it'll take more energy, but hopefully if we can start to talk about it within this particular framework, we'll be able to move forward with it. Now I want to just share a couple uh, passages just moving into this further. The House of Justice tells us where we are at with racial prejudice. They talk about the fact that we've done things as a nation, we've done things as a Baha'i community, but here's where we still remain. They say, well, it's true that at the level of public discourse, great strides have been taken in the falsehoods that give rise to prejudice in whatever form. It still permeates the structures of society and is systematically impressed on individual consciousness. So why do I bring that up? I bring that up because in the past, the way that we've addressed race, the House of Justice describes how we've addressed race. And they say we addressed it in fits and starts. We've addressed race in fits and starts. And they say the way that we've addressed race has merits, but has been limited. And to continue on that course of action, they said, would produce unsatisfactory results. Would produce unsatisfactory results. Now that's not saying everything we did in the past was wrong, or that it doesn't have a place, but to continue in the fits and starts is not going to allow us to move forward. What the House of Justice is telling us here is that racism has oppressed our consciousness, right? Systematically. So if it systematically uh, oppressed the consciousness of the human race, we need a system to do what? 
to remove it. So fits and starts is not a system, is it? But the, the community building activities that they've given us constitutes a system. They also say that expressions of racial prejudice have transmuted into forms that are multifaceted, less blatant, and more intractable, tractable, and thus more intractable. And then they say, the House of Justice stated the principles of Shoghi Effendi brought to the attention of the American believers more than 70 years ago are relevant today, and they will continue to be relevant to future generations. It's obvious, however, that the long and thorny road beset with pitfalls upon which the friends must tread will take them through an ever-changing landscape that requires that they adapt their approaches to the varying circumstances. And then finally, from our February 25th letter, and this is another kind of a point that comes up in the Baha'i community, which is a legitimate point, but which challenges us and really gets us into dichotomous thinking. So there are those of us who suggest that you know, before we can address race in the broader community, we have to address it in the Baha'i community. We address it in the Baha'i community because we've got racial challenges, we address it within ourselves, and then we go out to the Baha'i community and address it. That's a dichotomous way of thinking, and I think the National Spiritual Assembly has tried to get us to really think about that. And that comes, that thinking comes from a very pure, in my view, point of view, because we feel like, gosh, how can we preach to others when we haven't taken the medicine, in a sense, ourselves. But what we're finding, and what the House of Justice is telling us, what the NSA is telling us, is to this end, we have a twofold mission, they tell us. To develop within our own community a pattern of life that increasingly reflects the spirit of Baha'i teachings and, doesn't say before, doesn't say, it says, and engage with others in a deliberate and collaborative effort to eradicate the ills afflicting our nation. In other words, for us to address race, we have to engage with our fellow citizens in building this community, as Ken said this morning, that we want to build together. It can't be we have it and they don't, or they have it and we don't. And you know, the House of Justice went on to say, um, they said, you know, in the thinking of trying to address it ourselves, just by ourselves, they said that a small community whose members are united by their shared belief and characterized by their high ideals proficient in managing their affairs and tending to their needs, and perhaps engaged in several humanitarian project, projects, a community such as this, prospering but at a comfortable distance from the reality experienced by the masses of humanity, can never hope to serve as a pattern for restructuring the whole of society. And then they go on to say, even if such a community, and this is getting at what our thinking is about addressing race, even if such a community were to focus the entirety of its resources on the problem of racial prejudice, even if it were able to heal itself to some extent of that cancerous affliction, in the face of such a monumental social challenge, the impact would be inconsequential. Therefore, the friends must effectively assess the forces at work in their society and beginning in neighborhoods and clusters, contribute their share to the process of learning and systematization. You can never say that word. Systematization. Which, say that three times fast. Go ahead. Three times fast. Wow, I'm impressed. Of learning and systematization, which as their numbers and knowledge influence and influence grow, will transform their lives and families and communities. So it's clear we need to engage with the broader community. We have to do it in a systematic fashion. We do it broadly within the broad framework of the community building activities, but there's a spirit in which we do it. And Ken began to talk about this this morning, and I want to talk about it a little bit uh, this afternoon. And so Let's think about this passage in the, in the uh, February 25th message that, they, that the National Spiritual Assembly said the Lang, and I'm thinking about this in terms of this room, right? As we engage in the Baha'i community and out of the Baha'i community, the National Spiritual Assembly says the language we use and the attitudes we take while not ignoring the harsh realities that exist in the world should appeal to the nobler aspirations of our fellow citizens. Have you been in racial dialogues in the community that don't feel like this? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, we have. Why? Because it's a challenge. It's the utmost challenge to deal with the heartbreaking, heart-wrenching issues that affect and impact humanity when you're angry, when you're upset, when it hurts you deeply, and yet appeal to the nobler aspirations of other folks, right? Is that an easy thing to do? It's not. 
And so we have to think about that as a Baha'i community. We really have to ponder because this is something we bring to the table. This is something we can contribute to, and we have to do it among each other and also in the broader community. So let's think about that in terms of how we want to engage with each other here today. Does that make sense? Do we want to engage uh, with each other using these uh, using this uh, particular approach? Would that be okay? Yes? Uh, you know what I used to do with the youth back in the day? I used to put up my hand like this, and I used to say, Yes! You ready? Yes! Okay, so why is this important that we do this? You know, when we come to the table, when you engage in racial dialogues in your community, whether it's in or out of the Baha'i community, here's, here's a couple things to think about. People come to the table with different levels of understanding of this issue, right? You have people who come to the table with no sense of the history of race relations in the United States. I don't care where they are, there's people who have that particular perspective. Then you have people that are at that same table who know everything about the history of race relations. Now, when we're talking together, let's just say with those two uh, people's backgrounds, are we going to see these issues the same way? Okay, so they're at the table. Then you have people who come to the table who are in deep pain. They're in deep pain. They want to be spiritual, perhaps, but they hurt and they're in anger. And there's other people who come to the table and see all these challenging things about race or challenging things that are going on in our community. And what do they see? They see the possibilities. And so they're excited. Yes, this is happening, but gosh, we can move forward with this and we can spread the faith and we can do these wonderful things. And this other person sitting here in pain. Are they going to be talking in the same spirit? No. And then you have people who come to the table who have not engaged in dialogue about race very much. And you have people who come to the table who've engaged a lot in dialogue about race. And then you have people come to the table that are in a mood. You know what I mean? Just in a mood. So we come to the table with all these different mentalities, these different emotions, these different thought processes, and somehow in that, we are supposed to have discourse. Is that even possible? Okay, unless we draw on something much deeper. And so the House of Justice has given us uh, some ideas, and we know about consultation. We know about the importance of consultation. We know about the prerequisites for consultation. But as we think about coming to the table and trying to live this particular passage and bring it into practical application, the House of Justice has given us some ways to think about not only addressing um, race uh, directly, but ways that we can engage that help to eliminate, help to minimize prejudice. You know, when they tell us to, uh, and Ken talked about this this morning too, when they tell us that we have methods and approaches for addressing race, methods and approaches for removing oppression, they talk about two things. They talk about being and what else? Being and doing. So I want to just share a little bit about B. And I call these rules of engagement. The reason I call these rules of engagement is because the House of Justice said in addressing racial prejudice, as we engage with the broader community, this is their language and I'll put up the quote later. They said we engage with the broader community, we get experience by engaging, we consult about that experience and we learn. That's the formula they gave us. Let me just show you so you know I'm not making it up. Okay? They talk about the activities that we engage in, the feast, the holy days, all of these things. They say provide abundant opportunities for engagement, experience, experience, consultation, and learning that will lead to change in personal and collective understanding and action. So we have to engage. We engage with each other. We engage with the broader community. And they said when we engage with the broader community that issues of prejudice will inevitably arise will inevitably arise. So in that engagement, the issues of prejudice will arise, and that will give us abundant opportunities for what? To get experience in how to deal with it, right? To talk about that experience and then learn, but it's not in the abstract. It's by engaging with people in the community. Now, when you bump up, when I came to this conference, right, I was engaging, right? I had my prejudices, but I had to engage, and then I had to reflect on them because now I have some experience. And then I had to consult with myself, in this case. 
because I didn't talk, consult with anybody else. And then I learned, but could I have had that experience if I hadn't come here? Okay, I could talk about it in the abstract and talk about what a wonderful human being I am and that I don't have any prejudices and I treat people the way that I like to be treated and I don't see color and I don't see ethnicity. And then I'd come here and it would, I would realize, oh, whoops, because I'm engaged and it's not abstract. It's the same thing about engaging in the broader community. You will find these things. You will learn about your prejudices. You will be able to talk with each other and those in the broader community about your prejudices. But if you engage in a particular way, it's going to not only minimize those prejudices, but it's going to help you alleviate prejudices that people might have toward you. So as we move forward, I want you to think about in this room, and we're not going to have a lot of time for real intimate consultation, but I want you just to imagine that we we would have that time. Imagine that all of those people are coming together who are both people who've talked about race and haven't talked about race, who are in pain, not in pain, and thinking about the possibilities and know the history and don't. And I want you to think about which particular rule of engagement would you want to adopt as one that you just want to own for the two sessions that we are together. Just read through those yourself. I don't think I need to read them out loud. Should I read them out loud? Okay. Assume a posture of humility. Tread a common path of service, supporting each other and advancing together, respectful of the knowledge that each one possesses at any given moment. An unqualified love free of paternalism will be indispensable. Perceive honor and nobility in every human being. Delight not so much in their own accomplishments, but in the progress and service of others, and that they are engaged. In a, it, they, they are engaged as a reciprocal. That's the wrong wording. Sorry. In a reciprocal process, one in which everyone learns the relationship is not that of a learned one with a group of ignorant people. Okay. So these are the rules. Some there's many rules of engagement like this, but these are the rules. Some of the rules of engagement I call it the House of Justice has told us that we need to assume as we interact in neighborhoods. But does that make sense that we would assume these as we interact with each other as well? Because we are they and they are we. Is that correct? Yes, yes it is correct. Okay, so I want you to pause. I just want you to look and, and just reflect for a minute. And I want you to choose one. But choose one kind of thoughtfully. What is, what is one that you would like to kind of own? And I'm just going to wait 30 seconds, let you own one of these, and then we'll... Then we'll move forward. I wanted to think about the neighborhood now. Think about a community that you're in. And really just we're trying to get a feeling for this because these are part of the methods and approaches. You know, uh, yesterday, listening to some of the talks that people gave and talking about some of the feelings that they had and some of the things that, that they've experienced because of race or their gender, it was profound. And I think as we start to think about these rules of engagement and interacting in this way, we have to start to think about the healing power of interacting with another human being in this manner. And so when we think about going into a community, the House of Justice said that our community development work, our engagement in communities, starts with what? It starts with a conversation. Do you remember that? It starts with a conversation. And so as we bring this oneness building language, this justice building language, this unity building language to that first conversation with that first individual in that community, as we're building the civilization that Ken talked about, it is being grounded in that first conversation with oneness, unity, and justice from the very first conversation if we are engaging in that conversation in this way. Does that make sense? Okay, so these methods that they are giving us are profound, human, life-changing attitude. And I have some stories about the application of this that I don't, I'm going to tease you with today so you'll come back tomorrow. And so I'm going to tease you with just one. So I want you to think of, and you'll have to just kind of use your, your imagination here a little bit. I want you to think of a study circle. And I want you to think of a group that come together they're of different races and cultural backgrounds. But they come together to participate in this study circle with some reluctance, but they like the person who's having the study circle. This person who's having the study circle is a Baha'i, his wife is a Baha'i, and they like them. 
And so somehow, because they like them, they come to their home for the study circle and they're kind of interested. But they're not necessarily used to uh, engaging across race, class, and culture. But they come and they engage in the study circle, and um, they and they're starting to get along. But there's a little underlying tension uh, around issues of race because it's racial, ethnic, and class oriented. And so it comes time to start moving the study circle to somebody else's house, and they're going to go to a person of African descent's home. And the study circle members of the study circle are kind of saying no that they don't want to do it. They're finding reasons not to do it. Now the tutor of the study circle knows what's going on here, and he's upset, and she's upset. It's a co-tutoring. They're both very upset, and they have some feelings about the people that are saying these things about not going to this wonderful African-American's home that they love and care about. Okay? So, I want you to think about being that tutor, and I want you to think practically about these rules of engagement, and think about how the tutor would need to engage with that study circle to effectively deal both with the person who, whose house they don't want to go to, who's sitting in that study circle, and also the people who have these attitudes. What are the qualities that they would need to try to bring to the table, what I'm calling the uh, rules of engagement, to somehow massage that situation. What are the qualities and how might they bring those to the table? So this gets real, doesn't it? This is a real story. I'll tell you the outcome tomorrow. <laughs> but, you, but I just want you to process this because I think, you know, continuing to look at these uh, rules, and do it with the same person because we don't have time to move around, but think about what would be the important rules of engagement and how they might apply in that study circle? What would this tutor have to do? What would be important? The energy and the attitudes and what might he do or say? Uh, but just pick one of these qualities, not the one you, you chose necessarily, but just what might be important. Does that make sense? Okay. Is this real? Okay. Okay, so with your partner, just a couple minutes, whisper. Whisper. Okay, one more scenario. You know, we're just dabbling in this just a little bit, but I think, you know, I have a whole list that I'm going to hand you tomorrow. I guess I guess uh, I didn't want to hand them out today because if some of you don't come back tomorrow, then I won't have enough for tomorrow. But I have a whole list. There's probably about 10 more of these. I just went through all the guidance and tried to look at how is the House of Justice asking us to engage with those across race, class, and culture, really anybody. But particularly, I was thinking about it with those across race, class, and culture and the impact that it could have. And I was thinking about just this humble posture of learning. And I was thinking about uh, what Shogi Effendi said about it, that oftentimes, uh, and he was talking about white folks, have an inherent sense of superiority, right? And I started thinking, well, what, what, what is the opposite of an inherent sense of superiority? A posture of humility, right? So is the House of Justice addressing race and its plans? So as we, and, and, and here's, the, here's the point of saying that, and, and again, I know we're just talking about this in a, in a, in a short way, but, but here's the point of, of thinking about this, is that there are people that will get over their prejudices you know, in part by reading about the history, which is very important, in part by engaging, in part by learning. But you know there's, a, there's, a, there's behavioral therapy. You know there's called behavioral therapy where they don't get into all the symptoms and all the reasons and all of this. They just get into changing behavior, and as you change behavior, you change attitudes. So there are those people who just say, you know, I know I don't necessarily know all the things about race and I'm going to learn, but I can practice a humble posture of learning when I interact with human beings. What might that look like for me? What might this look like for me when I go into a neighborhood? And to consciously think about how I can delight in the accomplishments of others, how I can be respectful of the knowledge that each possesses at any given time. To constantly be thinking about that as I'm engaging with other human beings is going to start to get at that sense of superiority. It's going to start to get at those paternalistic attitudes. And yes, we need to continue to reflect and dialogue. And yes, we can just start to engage in these behaviors that the House of Justice has given us if we're conscientious about it. Here's the here's, here's last scenario. This is true. All these things, uh, these scenarios um, 
are things that have taken place in the Washington, D.C. Baha'i community. So, and that's where I'm from, and so I'm very familiar with it. This one is, uh, this is about an individual who, who uh, came to the Baha'i community. It's an upper middle class Baha'i community, middle class Baha'i community, Washington, D.C. is. Uh, very few uh, lower income people. Um, out of 300, maybe two. Um, maybe three, I don't know. No, but that doesn't matter, does it? Two or three. Well, this guy was a street artist. And he uh, was approached on the street when he was doing his artwork by a uh, white female. And she approached him. She didn't have a lot of experience dealing with people of other races at all. I know her background. She's told me these things. When she was growing up, she just didn't have a lot of experience with people of African descent. And most certainly not anybody of lower income background that was African American. But she approached him because she saw his artwork. And she talked to him, and she told him briefly about the Baha'i faith. She engaged him. And then she started talking to him about the importance of the arts how important the arts were in the Baha'i faith and invited him to come to the Baha'i Center. So he came to the Baha'i Center a couple of times. And then he just got angry. He got angry at the Baha'is, literally would call Baha'is and cuss them out. And why? Because he lived in poverty, he lived around crime and violence, the Baha'is were meeting at the Baha'i Center for these devotional gatherings, and after the gatherings, they were just talking about where they were going to go for coffee. And he expected them to be talking about what they would be doing to address these horrific issues. Him being one of them, or the consequences of one, now this guy had been in jail, a number of issues that he has himself, and so he just got enraged. He would come and he would blast people. He would go to the study. He joined the study circle because he liked this person. This one person who, who, he had something, some feeling, right? Because she approached him in a particular way. So something kept him. So he'd go to the study circle, but he would start with them too. He'd go, start to go on this stuff and he would, and literally he would call people on the phone and cuss them out. Right? Okay? Angry. Remember I said some people come to the table with anger? What rule of engagement would be important? If you were that person receiving some of that uh, that uh, language and that anger and those feelings, what do you think would be important? And you know, just talk about that a little bit. How would it be important to engage with him? Thinking about the rules of engagement and remembering what Shogi Effendi said. And again, just equating what Shogi Effendi said about being patient with any lack of responsiveness on the part of a people who have received for so long such grievous and slow healing wounds. Right? That's, what the, that's what Shogi Effendi said. Here are some of the things the House of Justice said that come together. Just talk about how, which rules of engagement might be important in this regard. Okay? Just with your partner or a different partner, it doesn't matter. Okay. You get the idea of these rules of engagement, how important they are, how healing they are, how, how significant they are. You know, when, uh, I wish I could remember the, uh, uh, I, I tried to write down yesterday some of the things that were said in this particular workshop about, about things that, that, uh, God, I'm just awful with the names and, anyway, she was talking about what needed to be in place when we engage with communities, and she talked about the fact that if any endeavor to engage in community, and this is from her professional background, it was going to be acceptable. We had to be supportive of people's values. What? Sida. Did anybody write down those things she said? And the reason I'm saying that is because as I sat there and listened to her talk about, from her professional background, what are these five key things that are essential in the community building process that must be in place. And if those are in place, then we can build. Do you have those? Okay. But it's about valuing people. It's about people feeling appreciated. It's about all these kinds of things, which these particular things hit. So professionally, she was talking about it from a professional standpoint about what's critical. And this is what the House of Justice is saying. And they match. Isn't that interesting? So 
as, as, as this last scenario, uh, goes, and then I want to take some questions. If I can, um, go down here and just, I'm, I'm going to take you to the end of what would have happened had we not been able to address this individual in the way that we did. And I'm going to tell you more tomorrow about some of the other methods and approaches that helped to sustain this individual. Can you see any of that? How about that? Okay. That's a portrait he did of Lewis Gregory for the bicentenary. And what would have happened had we not been able to have this process in place? And I only told you a little bit of it. I only told you about the rules of engagement. I didn't tell you about the study circle stuff and creative work, all those kind of, because that was a part of the methods and approaches too, right? That combined together to create this milieu of lifting oppression from people. But part of what sustained him, now think about some of the things that, that the House of Justice tells us to do. To engage people with what? The creative word, right? Bonds of fellowship. Building capacity in other human beings. What happens when people feel like they have a sense of identity and they have a place to express their capacity that's valued? That's what happens. You couldn't see the other four pictures, and all those were displayed at the bicentenary. Right? It's powerful. And, and we're learning about this. I'm not bragging. This guy still gets mad. Okay? It's not done. It's not this nice, neat story that all got wrapped up in a neat package, and now he loves everybody, and we all... But I'll tell you what. Because there was engagement, and because there was experience, because there was consultation, and because there was learning, our community is a different community. Because he's in it. We learn from him, and he learned from us, and we are still learning together. And it's part, there is a time in our community where we, we didn't, wouldn't have had the breadth to embrace being cussed out on the phone. I'm going to tell you tomorrow part of what the social action was and the discourse was that was involved in this as well. But I want to leave some time for questions both for Ken, uh, if you have any questions regarding any uh, his talk, and or just general questions or comments um, from your own experiences perhaps in the field and maybe how these rules enga of engagement have impacted you. Please. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I have a thought on that. Um, I don't know if you have a thought on that. Do you? Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, so they live in a homogeneous community. How do we engage with addressing race in this way when our community is homogeneous? Basically, is that it? Okay, so I think, um, and this is where I, I feel like as we consult and are creative, um, we start to come up with things. So, for example, uh, and I don't know what, the national, what, 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 who's all in your community? Oh, oh, in the United States. Okay. Um, let's just say it's an all, it's an all white community because I had this conversation with a white female last night who was saying the same thing that her community is all white. And I, I thought, well, okay, let's think of the community building activities. We believe in the oneness of humankind. So what might I do? Could I have a devotional gathering and read some of the writings about race and discuss what the role of white people are in addressing race in my community? Could I, could I talk in, in that devotional gathering or fireside or gathering in a kind of a community building way about the oneness of mankind? And what can we do in our community to expose ourselves to more people of diversity? And then start figuring out ways to do that, even within that homogeneous group. What are ways that we can learn more about diversity? What is it we need to do? How can we as a homogeneous community start to promote the oneness of mankind? Because this is an issue for humanity and we have a role to play even if we're not uh, engaged always with other people. You know, sometimes we have to go out of our way to engage with diversity. So a consultation and a devotional gathering or a community gathering where you start to talk with people honestly and earnestly from your heart the part of building our community is going to be able to understand and promote and deal with the oneness of mankind and what can we do? What is our role in our, and so that's one way to think about it. And I think uh, there's a lot that homogeneous groups can do. Wow. Whew. One, two, three, four. Please, in front. 
Um, I just wanted to ask, um, besides uh, racism and prejudice, there is also uh, gender inequality in this country and in uh, around the world, and it is, I think, equally like a divisive um, issue, but um, in Baha'i conferences and the Baha'i community, I feel that it's not addressed uh, as significantly as race is addressed, and there aren't as many writings. Uh, Shoghi Fendi writes about race uh, um, a lot, but not about gender equality, and I was wondering, uh, maybe Mr. Bauer just knows, if um, we work on this problem of race, is gender equality something that will naturally um, disappear, or it, or is it just not as important right now um, as as race? No, I don't think it's going to naturally take care of itself. Uh, what um, it has to be explicitly addressed, and it's very interesting now what we see happening. How harassment is being very explicitly addressed, and this question of whether we, particularly in our own society, are free of the uh, uh, abuses that take place all over the world that we like to decry in other countries but seem to be just as prevalent here are are doing. So I would say it's also very it's very urgent. It's true that it seemed as though The Guardian and Abdul Baha both felt more urgently in what they said about the issue of race. But I think the two are very closely interconnected personally. I don't I think that we have to address them as issues, each in its own right, but I also think there's an extremely strong connection. To give an example of it, there's a lot of now research going on on this question of racial prejudice and gender bias in societies. The Baha'i Chair for World Peace just had its own annual lecture, and the Baha'i Chair is at the University of Maryland, and their featured speaker was a lady who has engaged in a number of years of research on how to gauge the stability and overall health of national societies. So in nations around the world, she used measures showing the, um, that correlate the advancement of women and the health and stability of that state or that nation. Now, many of the measures that people often use are those such as how many women in parliament and how many women go to university and, you know, the kinds of things that would seem important and obvious indicators of the health of, uh, or, or at least the freedom that women have. But in terms of the stability of a society, actually the, the closest correlation has to do with how women are treated in the home, what rights they have domestically, in family life, in marriage, and the correlation is so tight that it's a causality. In other words, um, it, it's a, like a point zero zero one. There's no other better predictor of the health of a society than the rights of women in the home around the world. No other stronger predictor. Without it, what you have is an exacerbation of other issues, such as tribalism, racism, uh, interreligious conflict, and so on and so forth. And those don't correlate with anything else except the rights of women in the home. I mean, it's really quite amazing. So I asked that professor the question, do you believe afterward, I, do you believe that there is a correlation then between the factionalism and... Uh, the disengagement that we have from each other in the United States and the way the status of women in the home in the United States. And I said, and in particular, do you think there's a connection with the issue of race? And she said, oh, absolutely, most definitely there's a connection between these issues that has to be explored and understood. So I would say it also has a very high priority. That's my thinking of it. <laughs> My brother here is going like this. Uh, thank you. I'll tell you what. Please come tomorrow. We will start with questions. Honestly, we will start with questions tomorrow. I promise. Questions for Ken. General questions or comments, and then we'll go. But please come back so you can hear the rest of the story. Thank you very much.